Hi, this is Jim Labedo, and I'm president and founder of a company called Performance Group. You're listening to the podcast version of a program that originally aired on the BizTalk radio show. I started BizTalk so you'd have access to today's leading experts about growing your company and yourself. BizTalk is produced by Performance Group. At Performance Group, we work at the front end of a company's revenue stream. We find the salespeople who generate the revenue, and we provide onboarding programs that get them doing that sooner. Our passion is aligning talent with opportunity. That's why we're known as a Salesforce development company. Enjoy the program. If you're looking to simplify your business and get better results, this is the program for you. Because on our program today, we have John Spence, speaker, author, and executive coach. John has presented workshops, speeches, and executive coaching to more than 300 organizations worldwide, including Microsoft, IBM, GE, Merrill Lynch, and dozens of privately held companies. He's also known for taking massive amounts of research combined with his own personal hands-on experience to deliver timely, focused, results-driven programs that has him affectionately referred to by his clients as the human cliff note. We are fortunate that John is willing to share his insights from his book, Awesomely Simple, Essential Business Strategies for Turning Ideas into Action. John, welcome to the program. It's excellent to be here. Thank you, Jim. Well, John, we invite a lot of people to come on the program because we're interested in their topic. Uh, It had to be at an airport. I was walking through because that's where I find time to do most of my reading, and I spend most of my time at airport bookstores. And I see this awesomely simple, and I thought, wow, what a great title. And then I saw Turning Ideas into Action, and I thought, man, I have got, I think, two yellow pads full of ideas, but I don't have you know 48 hours in one day to get them all done. And so I was thinking, man, I got to get this guy in our program and find out how to take all my great ideas and turn them into action. So my first question is, John, I thought, w- what a great concept. So give people the background. How did you come to the realization that people like me and, and other business leaders needed some input about taking all of our great ideas and actually making them actionable? The main genesis that came from I've been very honored to be uh, asked to be a guest lecturer at the Wharton School for the last 12 years on strategy and strategic thinking at a huge conference for the Securities Industry Association. And year after year, I would ask my class, I get about 100 to 120 senior executives in my class, what percentage of companies that know what to do, that have a good strategy, that understand how to win in the marketplace, they've got a great plan, what percentage of the time do they effectively execute that plan? And for the last 12 years, it's been the same answer, 10 to 15%. And then I looked at all of the smaller companies I was working with worldwide and realized that if you'd asked me eight years ago what was their biggest problem, I would have told you lack of a vivid, well-communicated vision and strategy for growth, lack of a well-communicated vision. Four or five years ago, it would have been lack of courageous communication. Today, the single biggest problem I see in most of the businesses I work with is lack of disciplined execution and accountability. So there is a big wall between having a good plan and having great ideas and being able to turn them into reality in the marketplace with your team. What I was surprised about, and you made a comment on it, I think you said a few years ago it was what? Lack of communication? And then it was... Lack of a vivid, well-communicated vision and strategy for growth. So are you saying there's kind of phases you've seen businesses go through over the last decade or two? You know, it's, it's a great question, and I built my entire career around looking for patterns. As you know, I read about 100 to 120 business books a year, and I have for almost two decades now. And, you know, a lot of people go, don't they get redundant? And I go, yeah, isn't it Blake? Because after you read 30 books on one topic and they all say the same thing, you've discovered the pattern. Well, I also do the same thing when working with my clients. I look for the patterns in companies of what are the things that seem to be reoccurring over and over again. And it is interesting. It's gone in phases. And I think what happens is you see the phase, and then you and I would remember that five or six years ago, there was all this talk about getting a clear vision, making your vision your mantra, communicating your vision. And I think what happens is that a lot of folks realize that was an important part. The big phase I see coming up now is culture. An organization after organization I work in, People are talking about how can you help us with our culture, and it's a culture of accountability, a culture of execution, and also creating a winning culture of high engagement. So I think we're going to see that as the next big thing that consultants and authors focus on is, and I think Tony Shea with Delivering Happiness probably issued that in with the idea of building the culture he did at Zappos. 
But, you know, the great challenge of being in business is just as soon as you master something, there's another piece of the business that needs to be focused on. So, Exactly. John, my favorite quote on vision comes from Proverbs that says, you know, without vision, people perish. And if you're going to mark somebody around the desert for 40 years, you better have a pretty compelling vision. A lot of companies talk about vision, but they mainly give it lip service. You tie vision in to being effective and the effectiveness of your vision. Talk to our audience about that. Excellent. And let me begin with a quick caveat that says, especially now in times of great change, when there's turmoil in the marketplace and all that other stuff, people more than ever need to know where are we going together. And give me a vivid, clear, exciting picture of that. It doesn't have to be masterfully written. We're not trying to win a Pulitzer Prize here. But give me some clear, specific ideas so you can create a vivid vision of what the business is going to look like three, five, ten years from now. Then the key idea is to communicate that through every channel and then check on it constantly and say, are we living it? It's not a slogan. It's an outline for action, and it's about the behaviors of the organization. And one of my favorite sayings is, when values are clear, decisions are easy. And for me in a business, when the vision, values, and mission are clear, you've got much, much faster decision-making, higher levels of empowerment, higher levels of engagement. And it's got to be something that people get excited about and they can see themselves in that picture. So making it effective is, can I go from the very front line to the top of the company and have people quickly tell me, why is this important to you and what role do you play in making it happen every single day? And if we can't get there, then it's completely useless. And as a consultant, you know, I've been called in to do strategic plans and vision statements. And it frankly frustrates me because I go, let's just get it down to something clear, specific, easy, that all of your people are going to be passionate about and excited. And then let's just go live it every day. And then you're going to see the impact on the business much, much better than if you spent 50000 bucks to get some beautiful thing and we carved it in the stone out front. Our guest is John Spence. We're talking about the strategies from his book, Awesomely Simple, Essential Business Strategies for Turning Ideas into Action. If you're looking for other ideas on growing yourself and your business, they're available out on our website. That's biztalkradioshow.com. We have experts who cover every area in business from sales to marketing to management. That's available at biztalkradioshow.com. So, John, let's pretend that the company got the culture right and they're able to articulate that and you go in and work with these companies, but they're still frustrated about their talent acquisition. What's their frustration today? That's an amazingly great question. Here's the answer. And some of the folks listening to this will shake their head vigorously, is not being able to find enough people who have an ownership mentality. They may be talented, they may be bright, they may be incredibly creative, but getting across that hurdle where they become what I call intrapreneurs, you know, entrepreneurial inside of the company. When I talk to leaders and organizations, they tell me if I could just get my people to have more of an ownership mentality to treat this place like they owned part of it, to look at every dollar that comes in and try to maximize revenue, increase market share, increase customer satisfaction, decrease waste, decrease costs, but unfortunately not enough folks get in and dig in. So that's the the last frustration is there's two sides to the culture coin. There's the side the employee wants, which is a winning culture of high engagement, having fun, enjoying their job, being passionate. Then there's the other side of the coin, what the management team wants, which is an ownership mentality with high levels of proactivity, creativity, and high levels of both personal and mutual accountability. And it's a tough balance to get those two. You know, welcome to the job of being a leader or CEO or a business owner. That's what it looks at is how do I keep balancing, keeping people engaged while getting the ownership mentality and the results I need from all those folks. That's the biggest frustration. Talk to me about your experience when you go into organizations. What prevents them from having the best people in their organization? Two or three things, in my opinion. Number one, what prevents them is they're not doing a good enough job of making talent acquisition a strategic objective. They aren't thinking two, three, four years out of what will we need to grow the company, and they don't have a pipeline of talent that's coming in. And when a position opens, they've got eight or ten really world-class people or fantastic people that they can tap and bring into the organization immediately. So it's that lack of pre-planning and lack of a talent pipeline. For most businesses today, I just gave a speech earlier this week. I had 700 people in the organization from associations, 
And I looked at all of them and I said, you have to realize that none of you make anything. You don't make any lumpy objects. You don't sell manufactured stuff. Your entire organization is dependent on the quality of the people that you can get and keep on your team. And if that's true, and they all shook their head, then I said, then why isn't talent one of the major things you're focused on, not just when you need to hire somebody, but all your lumps? Number one is not doing a good enough job of thinking long-term about lining up a big bench, a deep bench of great talent you can go to. And number two is talent wants to work in a place with a great culture. The number one factor of highly engaged, loyal, and satisfied customers is highly engaged, loyal, and satisfied employees. And the biggest thing that attracts top talent is not money. You know, as long as you're 10% above or below what they would make to do the same job at any other company, money then comes off the table as a decision criteria. The major decision criteria then is what's the culture like? Who are the people like? Will I enjoy my job? Will it be challenging? Do I get to work with cool people on cool projects, having fun, doing something I'm passionate about and serving customers that I want to help? That's really what Top Talent looks for is I want to be on the A team and I want to play on an A team with great players doing cool things. The other side is I don't see companies paying attention enough to how can we build a culture that will truly attract the best of the best. And again, it, you don't have to throw tons of money at it. As long as you can pay a fair compensation that's close to what they would make someplace else, and you have an awesome culture, you can absolutely get the best people on the face of the earth to work for you. But companies tend to not focus on the people side, though, John. They tend to focus on, well, here's our product, here's our features, here's our benefit. We represent the best products in the marketplace, or we create the best service in the marketplace, and they tend to pour all their time and effort in getting that right, and then they hire mediocre people to go represent it. Where's that disconnect inside an organization that they focus more internally on products than they are on the people? So the tackle question, and one that's just barely starting to change, it used to be that the numbers, you know, the financials and everything were the hard stuff that we focused on, and people were the soft issues that were just sort of over there, and we let HR handle it. It's really turning now that people are where the money is, and unfortunately for some companies, the financials are very fungible, but financials are driven by quality people doing quality work. If you want to have world-class products, you've got to have the best engineers designing them. If you're going to deliver amazing services, you've got to have the best people delivering them. And I believe there's a shift in the marketplace now to understand, and especially after we've been through this recession, and some companies, frankly, have not treated their people real well, but because their folks didn't have any place else to go, they hung on and stayed. And I think we're going to see some top people moving companies or people in general saying, you haven't treated me very well for the last five years. Now that I have a chance to go someplace else, I'm going to jump and go. The reverse of that is companies that have taken care of their people. And again, it's not by throwing money at them. But by treating them well, treating them with respect, investing in their learning, giving them a great culture, I'll give you some quick numbers. A highly disengaged employee, one that doesn't like their job and doesn't like the place they work, and they would be called actively disengaged, and I would call this almost an employee terrorist, they're the one that wants to really try to hurt the company. And there's organizations like that. If you look at it on a broad spectrum, in a large company, it's probably, unfortunately, about 10 to 15% of your overall population. An actively disengaged employee costs you 22% of total revenues. Just take 22% off, throw it away, it's gone. The reverse is a highly engaged, loyal, satisfied employee, top talent that enjoys what they're doing, can increase your total profitability by as much as 189%. Now, I've just given you the two big numbers. If we cut them in half to 90 and 11, or cut them in half again to 45 and 5, I don't want to throw away 5% of my total revenues, and I'm not going to walk away from 45% increase in profitability. So however you place the numbers, great people who are highly engaged and love to serve the customer are a huge financial driver of success. What are the one or two things I need to be focused on in my talent acquisition? Deep pipeline. Then the other thing is, and this is a big one, is really sit down and strategically think through what are the skills and the abilities and the characteristics and attitudes and attributes I want in an ideal employee? I think that most people, when they go for hiring, do a couple of things wrong. First of all, because they don't have a deep pipeline, it's just a mirror test. You know, They pull in anybody, any resume that happens to come in that month. Just think about that. This person might be with you for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. If you don't have a talent pipeline, the only time you hire is that month that you announce that you have a job opening. That's the only window you have into the marketplace. 
not going back with a big deep bench. So that's number one is making sure you've got that bench. Number two is clearly thinking about what are the must-haves, the nice-to-haves, and the really, really nice-to-haves, and refusing to hire anybody who doesn't have the must-haves. I think a lot of people get emotional. They meet somebody. They like them. They kind of gel. There's a nice chemistry. And so they hire them because they like them, not because they meet all the criteria for the true, ideal employee you want. Which brings me to number three, most of the organizations I work in, especially smaller businesses, are pathetic at interviewing. If it's a one-hour interview, the interviewer talks for 45 or 50 minutes about the company, and in the last five minutes, the interviewee, the potential employee, says a few things about their background, and then the guy goes, or gal goes, oh, I love you, you're great, you'll be great on the team. It's the reverse. So training to make sure that you interview appropriately ask all the right questions, do the reference checks, do the tests, do all that stuff. And then also I'm a big fan for team interviewing. So if you put those things into place, big bench, deep pipeline, really clear idea of what you're hiring for, highly skilled interviewers and team interviewing, I think you've now at least knocked off three or four of the biggest problems I see in making sure that you make the right hire. And there's the old cliche, hire slow, fire fast, hire for attitude and aptitude, train for skills. Unless someone's going to be a brain surgeon and an airline pilot, I think those two cliches are pretty on target, and they've been around for years and years and years because they're true. John, you have it as a second chapter in your book, Get the Best People. How important is it, you think, in the future of the viability of companies? Oh, it's everything. I mean, it's a war. It's been a couple years, but it's a war for a talent. You can look at the global economic picture. You can look at, you know, most of us, even, you know, you and I, Jim, I compete on a global level. I have clients in Australia, New Zealand, all across Europe, all across Canada, Latin America. I'm not competing with the speaker, author, or consultant down the road. I'm competing with everybody on the face of the earth that's a management or a leadership expert. And I think that as soon as more businesses realize that they compete with everybody or soon will be, then you realize I got to get the best people I can possibly get on my team because you can't do it alone. And the future of your company is going to be tied directly to the quality of the people that are working with you. Now, that doesn't mean they have to be on your team per se. There's networking, there's mentors, there's associates, there's partners and things like that. So it's not just who can I hire and put on the payroll, but what is the huge universe of bright, sharp, smart, talented people that I can pull in to assist me with my business? Mastermind groups, mentoring, coaching, reading, studying, learning. You can have access to the most talented and smartest people in the world by buying their book or watching their podcast or watching them on YouTube or listening to their audio cast like this. And it's free. So now is another time to double down on lifelong learning and constantly increasing personal Kaizen, personal improvement. Well, thank you for your insights on that, John. Like you, I think it's going to be everything going into the next 10 to 20 years, especially the trend that I see that there is an aging population, especially in the sales arena, where we spend a lot of time working in talent acquisition with clients, and we see the aging of that, meaning we have some clients that have people that are in their 60s or 70s. Not that there's anything wrong with that. You know, my father's 92 years old, and he's still mentally alert and active, and he still contributes at some level. So age really doesn't matter, but at a certain point, it does become a factor, and we don't have a lot of people coming in in a younger generation to really fill some of those ranks. So we're all going to be competing for a shrinking labor pool, especially in some areas. Thanks for joining in on the conversation. This is your host, Jim Lebedo. Our guest is John Spence. We're talking about his book, Awesomely Simple, Essential Business Strategies for Turning Ideas into Action. Let's talk about the other topic I'm sure that you run into a lot. I run into it. So we have this vivid vision. We got some of the best people. But, boy, our execution seems to suck. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Right? We're just not that good in the execution area. So, again, you used a chapter titled Disciplined Execution. And obviously, I mean, that's that's pretty simple. Again, we need to execute. We need to be disciplined in our approach. And at the same time, what's preventing us, in your experience, from most of us being able to have a discipline behind our execution? I'm hoping that for your listeners, this is the most valuable part of the show because this is something I've been heavily, heavily involved in for the last three or four years. The folks at Apple, the Apple Specialist Group, brought me in a couple of years ago to work on disciplined execution, and they challenged me to make it as elegant and clear and specific as I could. So to me, there's two or three major things that get in the way of execution. The first one is not getting a clear, 
simple and specific execution plan. I've done a lot of strategic planning retreats where, you know, they put all the stuff on the wall and we got stickies and we're doing a SWOT analysis. We're doing all these other things. And everyone comes up with a great strategy and they think it's awesome. They go, great. And then they all go to the bar you know, and celebrate. I'm like, whoa, 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 hang on. We should spend, listen carefully, just as much time on the strategic action plan as we did in creating the strategic plan. So step one is, I don't think most organizations do a good enough job of taking their great ideas and getting it down to clear, specific, measurable, and the word I love is binary, actions and goals and steps. And here's one of my favorite phrases in the world, ambiguity breeds mediocrity where you take all the ambiguity out of it and you know this is exactly what we're supposed to accomplish. Number two, then, is to keep that in front of everybody all the time, the dashboard, to keep it out there. Make sure that you carry that to every meeting so everybody knows what are the goals, what are the objectives, what are the strategies, what are the action steps, and where are we today. And then quickly here, there's a thing that I developed, and you know, if you read 100 books on accountability, added it all up, here's what they're going to say. There's five steps to creating a culture of accountability in an organization. Step one is, is if you're going to give someone something to do, you're going to assign them a project or a task or a program or whatever it might be, step one is you must gain 100% clarity plus authority. So you've got to sit down and get very, very clear with the person. This is exactly what my expectations are. This is how we'll measure it. This is what that budget is. This is what the resources are. This is what the due date is. And this is the empowerment, the authority I'm giving you. Step one, 100% clarity plus authority. Step two, then, is 100% agreement. That person that you're giving it to, as my friends in Vienna call it, you have to have a four eyes meeting, and they got to look right at you and say, I understand the metrics. I think this is a reasonable goal. I understand the resources. I understand the budget. I understand the due date. I understand the expectations, and I will deliver them. I just did a speaking tour across Australia and New Zealand, had about 3,000 small business owners in all my different sessions, and I asked them for the most important projects in your company, the stuff you got to get done, the things that are mission critical on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being world class and 1 being terrible, how many of you currently are a 9 or a 10 on 100% clarity plus authority and 100% agreement on all your most important projects? And out of my entire trip across that country and the U.S. and Canada recently, not one person has raised their hand. Actually, one guy did, and I said, you're lying. He goes, you're right. I, I, you're right. So those two steps are critical. And then the last three steps are pretty straightforward. Track and post, create a dashboard. I don't care if it's a poster board or a whiteboard or a billboard or one of the you know, multitude of great dashboarding software packages they have out there. I use one called results.com. But grab one that works for your company because if you're going to hold somebody accountable, they've got to see where they stand every day. So the dashboard has to be highly visible and easy to understand so everybody knows where they stand against their goal. That's number three is track and post. Number four, then, is coach, mentor, and train. When you're tracking and someone starts to slip, they need to understand that you're not tracking them to punish them. You're tracking them so that the second they get off track, you can run in with help, support, training, resources, mentoring, coaching, whatever they need. And once they realize that, they have that paradigm shift from tracking doesn't equal punishment, tracking equals help, they will not mind the tracking at all. They will enjoy the tracking because they'll know it's going to make sure that I'm successful, which gives me the last one. Step five is celebrate success lavishly. If someone does a great job of delivering on their promise, consistently being accountable, Make sure that they're rewarded for that from a candy bar to a raise to whatever it might be, new plastic plant for their office, something cool. And the other side of that coin is deal decisively with mediocrity. If someone consistently isn't meeting goal and you're doing 100% clarity, you give them the authority, you get 100% agreement, they track and post, you coach and mentor, and they still don't meet their goals a couple of times in a row, this is probably someone that should be made available to industry because they're not going to be able to meet their goal. John, I always tell my clients that sales is an executional game. Can you effectively execute in sales? Give us your insight on sales as it relates to execution in a company. Sales is absolutely essential to every business. I I love the old saying, nothing happens until somebody sells something. A business can live or die by the quality of their sales force. So that is especially a place where if you don't have really good talent, you've put yourself at a massive disadvantage and not learning quickly to hire great salespeople and onboard them well and get them up to speed and create great customer relationships. To me today, 
sales is not about sales. It's about being a trusted advisor, a partner and a peer to your customers, and having them look to you as someone they respect and someone whose opinion they value and someone who they know will take care of them. And when you get that kind of a relationship with your customer, price goes out the window. It's all about solutions, about helping them, about being proactive, and about being a partner, not, quote, unquote, a salesperson, even though your role might be sales. John, you've given a lot of time, attention, and thought to this. So obviously you see that this is lacking in business today. Yes, I have. I've spent the last five years of my life focusing on this because it's such a big problem. It's the biggest problem with almost all the businesses I work with, from the top of the Fortune 100 to startups to small to medium-sized businesses. It's not that they lack creativity. It's not that they lack ideas. It's not that they don't have great products and services. It's that they don't have a culture of accountability and disciplined execution to turn those ideas into action. And, John, why do you think that is? It's great. It's a great question because people don't want to seem mean. People don't want to seem like I'm giving you a hard time. So, John, is this lack of accountability a cultural thing, or is it managers not wanting to appear too mean? (laughs) Well, that's how some people view it, and it is a cultural shift that all the people behind the boomers, the X's and now the whatever they call them, Generation C or Z, super connected, basically about under the age of 30 or 33, they did come up in a fairly different sort of a culture where, you know, you, it's the famous, you wear a ribbon for everything you do and you get a hug and a pat, even if you don't participate. So we are fighting a little bit of a cultural thing. Also that managers, they don't want to get into a confrontation. And here's why, and this is the thing, why I harp over and over again on the goals must be binary. They've got to be one or zero, black or white, yes or no. Because that way you can be very rigorous without being ruthless. You can say, Jim, I love you, man. We've worked together for 10 years. I think you're a fantastic guy. However, you promised to increase sales by 83%. That was your goal. You agreed to it. You've only increased it by 63%. Where's the other 20%? And that way you don't say, I don't feel like you're working hard. It doesn't seem like you're trying. There's no think, feel, seen. You either got the goal or you didn't. So one of the keys to being incredibly assertive but not aggressive having those binary goals so you can say it's not about me versus you it's not political and it's not personal and there's no ego there's a no it's just you made this commitment and you're not keeping the commitment what can we do to get you to where the commitment is and i think that's one of the skills that people haven't learned because you end up having that awkward conversation of well you know bob it doesn't really seem like you're trying hard enough and you're sort of kind of missing your goals and bob goes geez i thought i was doing great and you go, no, no, no. And, and if, once you get it down to that clear, specific, measurable binary goals as much as possible, everybody knows where everybody stands. There's no guessing. And in sales, it's pretty simple. What's your quota? You know, did you meet quota this month or not? It doesn't matter if I've known you for all my life and you're my best friend. Did you meet quota or not? There's no guessing about that. That's one of the things that keeps people from being, again, rigorous to hold people fully accountable without being what seems to them ruthless or mean or hurting someone's feelings. Feelings don't come into it all. This is all about performance. So what I hear you saying is, John, it's really getting clarity to the point where it's black and white. Either you're going to do this or you're not. And I think the other question is, are you willing to commit to what you said could be done? Right. John, a lot of managers struggle in this area of holding people accountable. Is there one tool or tactic that you've learned that can help them out in this area? Well, let me give you quickly a a tool that a lot of people use for this, and they say it's one of the most powerful things they take away from my workshops. And I use it for poor performers, but you could also use this for setting goals, and I call it the four pieces of paper, and it's in the book. It's quickly, if someone's struggling, and I use it, let's say, for a performance issue. Well, I've got someone who on my team is not performing at the level I need him to. I bring him in and say, come to my office and bring four pieces of paper. Piece of paper number one, I want you to write out clearly, Mr. or Ms. Employee, how your behavior will change in the next 90 days. What are you going to do differently to show everybody here that you should stay on the team? And again, I want it clear. I want it measurable. I want it quantifiable. I want it binary as humanly possible. No guessing. So piece of paper one, what are you going to do in the next 90 days to clearly show that you should stay on the team? Piece of paper number two then is what is everything you need for me to make that happen? What help, support, resources, training, what doors do I have to take in for you? You tell me what's everything you need so that you can absolutely deliver everything on piece of paper number one. That's piece of paper number two. Piece of paper number three is if you deliver everything on piece of paper number one, if in 90 days you nail everything on your list, 
in addition to keeping your job, which is pretty cool, what small reward would you like? Because if you really turn your behavior around like that, I think you deserve a little something to say thank you. So what give me an idea of what a great reward in addition to keeping your job and a reasonable reward would be on piece of paper number three. And then piece of paper number four is if I give you everything you ask for on piece of paper number two and you do not deliver everything on piece of paper number one, what should the ramifications be? And almost everyone puts termination or I turn in my two weeks. And then all you do is you negotiate those four pieces of paper to make sure they're fair and reasonable. You get clarity, and then you sign each one together. It's not a contract. It's not legal, but it's a promise between two professionals. And then every Monday, you just meet with that person and go, how are you doing on piece of paper number one? Well, look, we're 60 days in, and you're about 90% of the way there. This is awesome. I think you're going to reach it. I think you're going to get the bonus. And when we get there, I'm going to crumple these up and pretend it never happened, and you're just on the team, and everything's great. Or you go, hey, we're about 60 days in, and I've given you everything on piece of paper number two, and you've only accomplished about 10% of what you promised. What do you think is going to happen? Do you really think you're going to get the other 90% in the next 30 days? And that's typically when they say, no, let me just go ahead and give you my two weeks. And the neat thing about that is, because they wrote it, they can't go, I didn't understand. No, you wrote it. I didn't think it was fair. No, actually, you wrote it. I didn't understand the measurements. No, you're the one that wrote the measurements. That's the level of clarity. And the neat thing about that is the person has to take full personal responsibility for it. As long as you give them everything they ask for and it's reasonable, the ball is completely in their court. Thank you for that, John. I think that's something we could start executing on and using tomorrow. No, no, you look at me hey, listen, you're the one that wrote it. <laughs> Right. I'm here to help you. I'm doing everything. I want you to stay. I want you to be on the team. I'm helping you with everything on piece of paper number two, but you're not helping me so much with the stuff on number one. <laughs> it's not an uncomfortable conversation. I mean, if you just what it is, and I cannot tell you, I've owned or been the CEO of 10 companies, three of them multinational, and in my entire career, I've only had to fire a handful of people, but I've had many people self-terminate or just give their two weeks and say, it's obvious that I'm not right for the company. And I'm not going to be able to reach these goals, and that's not fair for anyone else here, so I'm just going to go ahead and leave. Our guest is John Spence. We're talking about his book, Awesomely Simple, Essential Business Strategies for Turning Ideas into Action. In addition to John sharing his expertise, you can find other experts that have shared their wisdom with us on BizTalk. They are available as podcasts on our website and cover business topics in the areas of recruiting, leadership, marketing, performance management, sales, and sales management, and personal development. You can download these podcasts from our website at biztalkradioshow.com. That's B-I-Z, talkradioshow.com. We continue our conversation with John. And, John, is there one question today I should have asked you that I haven't? Probably the only one I would think of that's on my mind that I think is important for your listeners is the idea of owning the voice of the customer. This is another area where I see so many companies fall down and do just a poor job of truly listening to their customers. And at the end of the day, you got to realize they're the ones that pay all of the bills. That doesn't mean they're always right, but if you don't have a robust system in place to listen to your customer through technology, through your Facebook, through your LinkedIn, through your surveys, through comment cards, through new user groups, through VIP, whatever it is, a business that's going to be successful today, in my opinion, has to put a fairly significant amount of effort and resources into opening up multiple channels for listening to their ideal customers, the customers they want to keep, the customers they want to grow. You'll always have complainers, and they're the outliers, and you listen to them. And if there's a pattern, you go, okay, maybe I need to fix that. But what I really want is the customers that pay on time, that love my services, that give me referrals, that bring back more business. I want to understand them as deeply as I can and create the strongest relationship I can because that builds an economic mode around your business, and that is another defendable competitive advantage that's very hard for your competition to copy, and it's, again, driven by talented people who create those relationships. And I like your chapter title on that. You say, own the voice of the customer. What exactly do you mean by that, owning it? Well, I mean that you are listening to them and talking to them and asking questions that they're not even thinking about the competition. I have so many small businesses that come to me and say, oh, but our competitor's doing this, our competitor. I go, listen, and I'll quote Joe Calloway, one of my favorite authors and speakers in the world, be the best at what matters most. Be so good they can't ignore you and have such a strong relationship with them that the competition becomes irrelevant. 
And owning the voice of customers says that we listen to them, we talk to them, we ask them questions, we survey them, we create a true bond between us and the customer. And once you own that voice and you're the one they're talking to, that means the competition has no idea what the customer wants. They don't have that relationship with the customer. You don't only own the voice of the customer, you own the customer. And as long as you listen to them and continue to deliver what is of true value to them, and I can boil down my entire strategic strategy class and strategic thinking class from more to this sentence. All effective strategy is just value differentiation times execution. Value differentiation times execution. If you continue to bring products and services that are unique and highly valued by your customer because they're the ones that ask for it, and you can execute in delivering them effectively at a cost-effective price, not the lowest price, but a reasonable price, then you will own the marketplace and you will have an effective strategy. But there's a couple things that go in there. You have to listen to the customer and you have to be able to execute on the ideas and bring them to the marketplace in a way that the customer values them. John, you're with the president of a mid-sized company today. The one piece of advice you're giving them is what? You have to be in the living example of what you want your people to be. If you're going to run this company, they see everything you do, they hear everything you say, they see what you don't do, they hear what you don't say, and they make up a story about it. One of the biggest jobs of an owner or a CEO of a small to medium-sized company is symbol management, is being a true living example of what you want your people to be. That means honesty, integrity, proactivity, disciplined execution, accountability, valuing the customer, showing respect to your employees. If you don't do it, None of your managers will. And I don't care if you got three people working for you or 300 or 30,000. You live on a stage 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all year long. Never forget it. Welcome to leadership. It's your job to set the pace, set the tone, and set the example. John, if people wanted to learn more about what you do and what you offer or even insights from your book, Awesomely Simple, what should they do? Just go to my website, which would be is johnspence.com. There's a lot of free resources there, too. I've got a free YouTube channel with a bunch of short trading videos. I've also got a Vimeo channel with a whole bunch of free videos. And also, as a voracious reader, one of the questions I get all the time is, if you've read all these books, John, what are your top 50? I have a list of the top 50 business books, in my opinion, that I've ever read. And the reason I believe they're top 50 is not because of the great theories. It's because it's a book you can open up and go, oh, I can go do that right now. That's a great idea. Let me go implement that right now. So johnspence.com, lots of free videos, lots of free stuff, and a great list of all my books. And pretty simple, too. My email is john at johnspence.com. Anyone has a question or a comment, don't hesitate to send me a note, and I will do my best to answer it for you. Connect with me on LinkedIn or the other social media, and I'm there to assist. I've dedicated my life to helping small businesses and helping people be more successful. And I love it when somebody sends me a question and says, what do you think about this? Can you help me with that? John, thanks for being on the program. It was my honor and my pleasure, Jim. Thank you. This or other BizTalk podcast may be downloaded by visiting our website, biztalkradioshow.com, where you can subscribe to BizTalk through iTunes. Follow us on Twitter at BizTalk1040 and like us on Facebook. If you want to learn the strategies finding and getting performance out of A-player salespeople, contact Performance Group by calling 800-950-9509. Or visit us on the web at pmgllc.net. This has been your host, Jim Lovato.